Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It's June 3rd, 2015, and here's a look at our top stories. Tonight, a 36-year NSA veteran turned whistleblower breaks down the passage of the USA Freedom Act. Then, a family in Mississippi is facing possible jail time for cheering on their loved ones at a high school graduation. And a senator in Rhode Island wants to use RICO laws to prosecute global warming skeptics. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. A Rhode Island senator, Sheldon Whitehouse, just seriously suggested that people who are skeptical of global warming models and predictions should not only be censored, but prosecuted under the RICO Act. That's the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act of 1970. You know, going after organized crime. The government was having trouble getting convictions for organized crime because the mob could always hire the best lawyers. So they decided they'd take away their money first so they could get a conviction. But when you take away constitutional rights for the mob, you take them away for everyone. Within 16 years, Reagan signed civil asset forfeiture laws that allowed the police to confiscate property even without charging you with a crime. By 1994, RICO was being used against pro-life activists. So it's not a stretch that this government would use RICO against people who are skeptical of its agenda. For more information, go to InfoWars.com. I'm David Knight. That's right, David. In that article, he was referring to Senator, use RICO laws to prosecute global warming skeptics. And basically, he breaks down how things like political lobbying, contributions to political candidates, and the use of media efforts is undermining climate science. And the thing about this is when we talk about the climate science, as we talk about quite often here, I'm not a scientist, but this doesn't really seem like science to me. Because as you guys recall, we talked about it at a great length earlier this year, 2014, the hottest year on record, except Chicago, Illinois, and Detroit, Michigan, and those are just two cities off the top of my head. So they say it's the hottest year on record, but it's also cold here, and it somehow makes sense, even though we said it was hot, it's supposed to be cold. And now they don't use either global warming or global cooling. It's an all-encompassing climate change. So to put it to you like this, let's say we're betting on a football game, and you know it's the Cowboys versus the Eagles, and I say the Cowboys are going to win, unless the Eagles win, and then either way, I get the money. You say, that doesn't make sense. That's the same thing they're giving you with climate change. They actually had just some backup, this is what it's going to be this year, fine. If it's extra hot that year, fine. But if it's extra cold that year, you can't say that you won when you said it's going to be hot. Do you understand kind of what I'm going here? And then they have their pundits go out, like they're talking about the pundits here. They have their pundits go on MSNBC, and they say, don't use global warming, don't use global cooling, use climate change. So regardless what the temperature is, you will be accurate. And it's not just there. As you guys recall, we did the report last year, 2014, U.S. college professor demands imprisonment for climate change deniers. So they're saying that if you have any type of skepticism at all, you need to be jailed and dealt with and possibly even re-educated. Now, to be very clear, when we talk about the climate, I definitely understand that climates change over time. My biggest argument, if you disagree with everything I've said thus far, Let's think about this in just terms of money. People understand that. What is paying all these carbon taxes going to do to stop uh, global warming? Seriously. Like, if you're like me, you have a car, you have an apartment. If you have to pay out the wazoo for carbon taxes when you have these big companies, you know, with these big plants and all this stuff, what's that really going to do? What's your contribution going to do to help anything? Nothing. All it is going to do is line the pockets of these politicians, these pundits, and these people who keep pushing this global or climate change agenda. So that's enough on that. Let's switch gears and talk about the climate here in the city of Austin, Texas, or more accurately, the climate of the internet at large, because we see that the man behind the Silk Road is now in prison, uh, the 31-year-old operator of the Silk Road. This is Ross Ulbricht. He was sentenced this past weekend to life without parole. And the reason they busted him and came down so hard on him is because the site, the Silk Road, they said, he allowed all this illicit activity to take place, and thus he needs to be dealt with very harshly. Now, his defense was saying, hey, I just set up a website, and they said, well, people were dealing drugs in your website. Well, let me let you in on a little secret. People were dealing drugs a long time before the internet came around. 
And you can do other things on uh, Silk Road as well. I looked on there earlier today. You can uh, look at books and you know magazines. You can get all kinds of stuff on there, just like you can get on Craigslist. People just chose to use it for the avenue of doing drugs as well as many other things. Same thing if you go to Craigslist. You know, there's people who do prostitution on Craigslist. Do you shut down Craigslist? Uh, the, you have pedophiles looking for children on Facebook. Do you shut down Facebook? No. They have action teams. They have, you know, uh, these, cy these cyber cops who sit around and pose as little girls so they can get these predators off the street. That's how you deal with these things. You don't just lock people up and throw away the key. So it's a very unfortunate uh, situation. And hopefully, I mean, life without parole, that's a really tough sentence. And I, I'm not exactly sure how you can combat that. But uh, just keep this in mind, you know, if you put anything out there, if you start anything on the internet, if you start a whatever site, you know, a, the new Amazon and somebody does some illegal activity on there, they may come after you and try to put you in the slammer just like they did for this unfortunate gentleman. Now let's talk about somebody else going to the slammer. Let's say you go to a graduation ceremony. You know, it's, it's a great time. You know, you have kids, maybe they're in a troubled neighborhood. And I don't know about the town where you live in, but all around the city of Austin, Texas, they have these billboards, you know, X number of kids don't graduate, but 100% of kids need help getting through high school. So if you want to support these kids, now they're saying you can't do that in the state of Mississippi. And we have the article, family threatened with jail for cheering graduating relatives. You did it, baby! <laughs> A week or two later, I was served with some papers. Papers that threatened to throw them in jail. Superintendent Jay Foster found disturbing the peace charges against them, and officers issued warrants for their arrests with a $500 bond. The fact that I might have to burn out of jail or pay court costs of a $500 fine for express my love is, is ridiculous, man. It's just, it's just ridiculous. And if you thought that was the only example, oh, no, no, no. Now we have this Native American student sues to wear eagle feather at graduation. Somebody called and said that I could wear it as an ornament in my hair. It's not an ornament. It's so much more than that. And it's representing who I am and what all I've worked for. It made me really upset because it made me feel like I had to hide who I am. This is a rite of passage. It's honoring my ancestors and my elders and just basically everybody who I am, Native American. So what type of example are we setting for our students? If you go and cheer for somebody, you could be arrested. Or if you want to honor your heritage, then, oh, no, you can't participate. So these are the type of things that our children are being indoctrinated with just to follow the orders blindly. Like, even when I went to high school, you know, you can, they didn't want you to bring out beach balls and stuff like that. But, you know, if you had a little swag, a little flair, it wasn't that big of a deal. Now they're cracking down on you all together. You can't cheer. You probably can't even smile or even enjoy yourself. You just have to go and uh, suckle and beg to be let on stage or enjoy the, uh, the time there in the festivities. So we'll switch gears entirely and talk about the banking system, you know, the, the cash, the cashless society. And to be straight, you know, I have no issue with people who use credit cards or bitcoins and stuff like that. But you don't want a completely cashless society where every transaction you make is monitored. And Alex talked about this on the Alex Jones show today, talking about cookies and doing things such as that. And he gave the example that if you're a company that, that buys a bunch of plane tickets, they just assume that you have all types of money and they will actually bump up the price of your plane ticket. So that's for all the people who say, I have nothing to hide. No, if your cookies show that you purchased something, they'll just make you, or they'll give you the suggested price that they think that you can actually afford. But now we have this article by Paul Joseph Watson, Economist, Financial Elites Fear Provoking Bank Runs. And this is Martin Armstrong. He warns that the financial elites are plotting to abolish cash, but are weary of warning the public because it could cause bank runs. Basically, when everybody wants to go get their money out at the same time, I believe it was that movie, It's a Wonderful Life, if you want to see what that looks like on film. So this is why you don't want to have all your eggs in one basket, whether it's credit cards, whether it's bitcoins, whether it's cash, whether it's gold, whatever. You want to diversify and have many different ways to have commerce that's not dependent on one particular thing. But you know, ultimately, people are going to do what they want to do anyway. And we'll end with a sign of the times before we go on to more special reports. San Francisco, which I went to, uh, it's not my favorite city in California. I rather enjoy San Diego, but, you know, it's nice. It has the Golden Gate and a nice view and all that. It got pretty much destroyed in that movie, uh, San Andreas with the Rock. I went and saw that this weekend. But basically the point I'm getting to with this, they say San Francisco's median rent 
hit a ridiculous $4,225. Now, you may be saying, hey, they got all those tech companies out there, those guys making the big money. But as it states in the article, it's saying that even those guys are getting to the point where they cannot afford this ridiculous rent. Here in the city of Austin, Texas, I don't even live in a great neighborhood and my rent's going up and up and up. I'm like, the service isn't getting any better. Why do you keep charging me more money? But they have to do that because, you know, the city and all these other things that are going on. So uh, sign of the times, you know, back in the day when you could, you know, get a soda pop and a puppy dog and all that stuff for 99 cents. Now you can't do anything for 99 cents. You can't even get something out the vending machine. It's like $1.19 or $1.20, whatever it is now. So this is what's going on. And after this break, we'll tell you more about what's going on. Rob Dew will have a special report breaking down Bilderberg. He's going to be heading out, I believe, this weekend to go out to see the uh, pageantry, I guess you would say, of the global elite meeting in secret. But you remember way back when they said it never happened, but now that it's happened, yeah, we get together and we you know, do all these things. We dress up in our robes and walk around, but you don't need to pay attention to that. Just look at this guy over here playing with the puppet. That's what happened last year. But you can find more reports right after this break. This is the InfoWars Nightly News. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Vote for Jeb, or you're just fucking stupid. Fool me, we can't get fooled again. This is Rob Dew from Infowars.com with a special Bilderberg 2015 report. Now next week, myself, Josh Owens, will be traveling to Austria. We will be meeting Paul Joseph Watson there, and we will be in the Tyrol region, which is a state of Austria, sort of in the eastern mountain region. A lot of ski resorts there, a lot of tourism, but a lot of small towns. And the hotel, the Interhalpen Hotel, where the 2015 Bilderberg will be taking place is very secluded. We're gonna put a map version up and you can see it's surrounded by trees and forests. There's a golf course nearby, but then nothing else for about 15 minutes. So it is definitely isolated and there's a lot of security going on ramping up for this. And there's a lot being written about that, but not in the American press. It's mostly in the foreign press. I actually had to find these articles. They're from Austrian websites and uh, German websites, even an RT international website and I had to translate them using Google Chrome so some of these uh, quotes that I'll be reading from might not be in the most perfect English but we'll just go ahead and run through those but before I get to those articles I just want to let you know we will be providing total coverage while we are at Bilderberg 2015. Both Josh and myself are pretty good editors and cameramen plus we'll have Paul Joseph Watson there providing some of the best intel and using his contacts so I think we're gonna be giving you a really complete picture of what's going on. Uh, there's gonna be several protests in the towns surrounding the Interhalpen Hotel, and we're gonna be covering those as well. So be checking the Alex Jones channel on YouTube, be checking our Ustream channel, and I'll, we'll be putting all the links of that in this video so you can check that bookmark it and go back to it as Bilderberg takes place. We'll be landing on Monday. Uh, on the 7th of June. And what makes this Bilderberg so different from all the others is now we have this war in the Ukraine. So that is gonna be on the main agenda of what is talked about there in Bilderberg. Of course, it'll all be in secret. Uh, also about the killing of cash. That is now the new buzzword. We have to get rid of cash so we can let bankers basically not even print money anymore. They're just going to change digits in spreadsheets and thereby giving themselves millions and taking it away from us. And also, the amount of foreign immigrants they're going to be bringing into Europe, that will be discussed. They're definitely doing it here on our southern border, and it's not just Mexican immigrants, it's also Central American, South American, and even African immigrants, as we've shown the videos here and showed you the news reports. So there's a lot to be talked about at this year's Bilderberg, so this is gonna be a very important one. Also, it is right near the uh, G7. In fact, the G7 is going to be just a few days before Bilderberg, and it's only going to be about 40 miles away in Elmu, which is, I believe, in Germany, the Bavarian area. And so they will be traveling from there to the Hotel Interhalpen for Bilderberg 2015. ExtremeNews.com reports that the Interhalpen Hotel is just a 26 kilometer or a 40 minute drive from the Ilmu region where they will be meeting for the G7. Extreme News also reports that up to 2,000 Austrian police will be in the area surrounding the hotel. Also up to 24 specialists from the anti-terrorism elite unit, which they call COBRA, which I think is really interesting. 
uh, Cobra being the mortal enemy of the fictional G.I. Joe. And in addition, there's going to be up to 17,000 German police officers on the border ready to come in if called for. And they're estimating up to 360 million being spent on all the security, of course, which the taxpayers are going to be paying for. Journalist Heiko Schrang reported in his newsletter that the abolition of cash in addition to the issues in the Ukraine conflict and the promotion of refugee flows to Europe will be on this year's Bilderberg agenda. And I'm sure there will be other issues of importance that will be talked about in this year's meeting. And we'll be getting those through the leaks, through the normal channels of people hearing what's going on there and coming out and saying, hey, this is bad. We've got these world leaders planning some really terrifying things. So we're gonna be getting a lot of tips that way. You can rest assured. I found an interesting tidbit on a website called Ausberger Allgemein and they're reporting that the footpaths and different hiking trails around the Hotel Interhalpen are already being controlled. And they say, <laughs> this is interesting, hikers are advised to insert a card in the pack, which I think means have your ID on you, but that's how uh, Google Translator translated this particular article. But we're gonna put the links to all these articles down there and I encourage you to get them, translate them for yourself, or if you do speak German, maybe put uh, what they're really saying in these in the comments below. The Der Standard contains a report from publisher Oscar Bronner, and what she talks about alternative conferences that'll be taking place, one in Innsbruck and one in Telfs. The Innsbruck one will be more like a conference where people are gonna get together to talk about Bilderberg, and Telfs will actually be a demonstration. Telfs is a really small town, as you can see on this map, and it's about a 15 minute drive down a winding road or up a winding road up to the Hotel Interhalpen. And finally, you can find much more information about the conference and the protest at Bilderberg 2015 protest, BBP 2015 at gmx.at. They write, our protest platform has been organized deliberately in the city of Telfs and not demonstrated directly in front of the Interhalpen Hotel, an extensive information program on power and influence of elites in Innsbruck. The aim of our protest platform is to enlighten how powerful elites from industry, banking sector, intelligence agencies, and the military influence our politicians and media companies. Education and information are the most powerful weapon against aberrations of society. And finally, RT International reports Bilderberg 2015, the elite meet in mid-June in Tyrol, and they kind of poke fun. I think they're poking fun at David Icke. It contains a quote here, which doesn't really translate well, but they talk about the keep the secret world government, Illuminati descendants, satanic bloodlines, reptilian humans. Uh, such conspiracy theories are used to disguise the true nature of this conference and are often taken back by any criticism. We are against the Bilderberg Conference because they are lobbying at the highest political level that has operated, and this contradicts the demands of democracy and transparency. And that's the big problem that most people have with the Bilderberg meeting. It's at 120 to 150 of the biggest elites in Western Europe and the United States and Canada get together to meet in secret. There's no published agenda, there's no press allowed, and this definitely demands transparency and openness because we cannot have meetings like this if we are to live in a free world. And this proves that we don't live in a free world, that meetings like this can exist, and the international giant press won't even really talk about it until we force the issue with the alternative media. And that's why Infowars.com is gonna be there from June 8th to the 14th, covering everything about the Bilderberg Conference that we can to try to get you the most up-to-date information from the sources themselves. This has been Rob Dew reporting for Infowars.com and Infowars Nightly News, and I'll be seeing you at Bilderberg. Earlier today on the Alex Jones Show, we had Kirk Wiebe. He's an NSA whistleblower. He worked with Mr. Benny, Mr. Drake, all those guys. And he was telling us all these things that, according to Senator Marco Rubio, never happened. Mr. Rubio wants you to believe that there is nobody monitoring your phone calls or your internet conversation, you can check the things on your phone. But Mr. Wiebe said this is the exact opposite of reality. Yes, we know they can track your phone calls, not only track them, who you talk to on what date, we all know that, but also have your conversations recorded. Case in point, the Zarnayev brothers, Boston Bombers. Now, regardless of what you think about that, the official story, whatever, they were recording the conversations of the Zarnayevs before they were listed as suspects, which is bulk data collection. If they can go back and listen to their phone conversations before they were listed as suspects, you think they can't go back and to li listen to yours as well? But this is what they want you to believe. This is the big smoke screen that they're trying to sell you. And Mr. Wiebe has such good things to talk about Mr. Benny, we're gonna let him intro this piece and then go to a piece that we shot with Mr. Benny when he visited us in studio just a few months ago, telling us how this is all going down and has been going on for a very long time. Here's a look at that report. Ladies and gentlemen, Kirk Wiebe joins us. After spending uh, four years that included tours of duty in Turkey and Japan with the Intelligence Army of the United States Air Force, 
During 63 to 67, Kirk attended Indiana University, receiving master's degrees in Russian language. In 74, the year I was born, Kirk then headed east to work for the National Security Agency, retiring in October 2001, same time that Benny and Drake and others left. And then, of course, got SWAT teamed and they tried to set him up. Now we have the USA Freedom Act signed, and they're claiming it's a reform. From what I've seen, what you just heard David Knight break down, it's actually just a shell game. Kirk Wiebe, thank you so much for joining us today. Alex Jones, it's a distinct honor to be with you. Well, it's great to have you, sir. Uh, you know, I could ask a lot of questions here, but why don't you start at the beginning and just recap what you've witnessed being inside the NSA, what's happened since, and then I'd like to get your take on the USA Freedom Act. Um, <clears throat> what's happened in a nutshell, Alex, is the very thing, the very thing that Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, on the night of January 17th, 1961, warned all of us about. And that is the, <coughs> excuse me, undue influence of the military industrial complex on the ability of this government to function the way the founders intended it to, unencumbered by outside influences other than those expressly set up to deliver the voice of the people. So we have people willing to sacrifice the security of the nation for money. It's really corruption that is the real elephant in the room in the background here behind all of this. I fear we're headed down that path of last resort, where if you look to how we're gonna deal with this, we're gonna have to march on Washington. And, and I don't know if you're going to pick up a pitchfork, a baseball bat, or what, it, to do it, but we've got to start making our voices heard. We've got to get their attention. You know, I would love, I would probably give my life for the opportunity for Bill Benny to be invited to Congress. And why wouldn't they? The guy's a genius. We know how to do this job called intelligence in big data, catch bad guys, protect privacy at the same time without giving up anything, and they won't even talk to him. They won't even invite him in, not even a closed And he's session. the guy that invented most of the systems that they're getting rich off of. Exactly. And he didn't invent them for this purpose. We built the protections in. And my God. I know it's all classified, but basically I gets into algorithms and all, all the rest of it, where you can really zone in on the algorithm of the real bad guys. But when you add all the data, it just screws it up. The whole point is that under a surveillance state, you have very few liberties. Now, unless they, if they don't want you to have certain, do certain things, then they have ways and means of getting to you, like they did with us or other people. They would find things to use against you, to leverage you or influence you to do the, what they want you to do. You know, if you have nothing, uh, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. Well, that's a great quote from Joseph Goebbels, first of all, and secondly, it's totally irrelevant what you think. What you think is totally irrelevant. It means absolutely nothing. The government only considers its view of you, and if you're doing something they don't like, they will come after you, no matter what you think of it. Does the NSA routinely intercept American citizens' emails? No. Does the NSA intercept Americans' cell phone conversations? No. Google searches? No. Text messages? No. Amazon.com orders? No. Bank records? No. I thank you, and just for you, Director Clapper, again on the surveillance front, and I hope we can do this in just a yes or no answer, because I know Senator Feinstein wants to move on. Does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? No, sir. It does not? Not wittingly. There are cases where they could in inadvertently, perhaps, uh, collect, but not, not wittingly. But to conduct that kind of, of collection in the United States, it would have to go through a court order? and the court would have to authorize it. We are not authorized to do it, nor do we do it. Bill Benny, a legendary NSA mathematician, 
led development of a revolutionary computer system to collect, isolate, and connect important information, like phone calls and financial transactions. Its code name was ThinThread. My name is Bill Binney. Uh, I worked for NSA uh, in the military and as a civilian for a little over 36 years. Uh, and I designed a lot of the, uh, uh, the logic and architecture that they're using to spy on everybody in the world. And when I started doing this and using it against U.S. citizens, I became a whistleblower. Uh, I had other people who were with me as a part of that whistleblowing, like four other people, including Diane Rourke from the House Intelligence Committee and uh, Tom Drake, Kirk Wiebe, and Ed Lewis, who were also NSA employees. So we were all part of that, and uh, we tried to influence the government internally, and they attacked us for it, and tried to put us in jail, fabricated evidence. Uh, we caught them at it, so they failed. The FBI raided the homes of all the people you've met in this story who filed that confidential complaint with the Defense Department. They came busting in. Uh, I was in the shower at the time, <laughs> and uh, one of them came running up uh, and uh, was pointed a gun at my eyeballs and pulled me out of the shower, so. He drew a gun on you? Uh, yeah, he had it pointed at my head, yeah. Talk about what a hero and how much courage you've got. I mean, you know how serious people are in this government, what they do worldwide, how corrupt it's gotten at that point. You had the will to march into Congress and to tell them what was going on, the first guy. I mean, that's 10 times bigger than Snowden internally. And to really start this whole internal debate and this avalanche of understanding now, I mean, you were really one of the first people to ring the bell to warn folks that, that the country as we knew it was being dismantled. I went to the terrorist uh, analyst shop, which we had running there for quite some time, and I said, uh, I asked them, um, in all the work you're doing to analyze uh, the terrorist problem around the world, which sites are the ones that give you information that you find valuable? And so they gave me a list of 18 sites, and so I took those 18 sites and said, okay, these are the, these are the deployment targets for our process in January of 2001. Uh, and it was, uh, we estimated the cost to be about nine and a half million dollars. That's all. Basically, uh, it was working uh, uh, like a year and a half before 9-11 occurred, almost two years before 9-11. And uh, if they'd have deployed it, uh, we would have, uh, we would have, in my view, there would be no way we wouldn't have stopped 9-11. Because all the data, uh, Tom Drake took the program after they killed it because of, it didn't cost enough money. So, so that meant that they, they had to create another program, which they called Trailblazer. That was, the initial cut at that was $4 billion. And after that, it only grew in terms of money. They kept getting more and more. So the, 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 the whole point was that they, they had a, a whole host of contractors that wanted to feed on all that money. And if you, if you took the program we did and deployed it, it would already solve the problem. So the point is that you can't go to Congress asking for money for a problem you've already solved. So they had to kill the solution to say we have a problem so they could justify getting the money. And that's exactly what they did. They know exactly what they're doing. And the reason you can tell that they know is because they're keeping it all secret. If they weren't, if they weren't really trying hard to keep it secret, then they might. Then you might think that they they were delusional and they didn't understand that, what they were doing. But when they know that they're doing something wrong, they have to keep it secret. Otherwise, they feel they'll be held accountable for what they do. Why else would they keep all these things secret? Do things in secret with a secret court, keeping their interpretations secret, and making secret interpretations and rules for the for a constitution in secret, in hiding it away from most of Congress and their, and certainly all of the public. So if you do that, you're hiding something and you know you're doing that. I put it down to three factors, power, money, and control. That is, if you can have an uninformed electorate and an uninformed Congress, you can manipulate them and control them. And especially if you're pulling in a lot of data about them, you can do that and use it against them to get them, to leverage them to do what you want them to do. A British newspaper dropped a bombshell that the U.S. government has been collecting millions of Americans' phone records without them knowing about it. A lot of people are, are learning that the uh, scope of these uh, surveillance programs is, is immense. The government is monitoring private phone calls, your children and my children's private phone calls, and tracking who their associates are. Right now, the U.S. government knows who he is calling, where she is calling from, and how long they are talking. When it comes to telephone calls, 
Nobody is listening to your telephone calls. The NSA is trying to create a database to get ahead of what I think is the, 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 a real growing threat. Homegrown terrorist cells already here. It's to ferret this out before it happens. It's called protecting America. When it comes to keeping us safe in the war on terror, I think the president's program, President Obama's program, is the right one and it's a good one. His name is Edward Snowden. He's an American former CIA employee and computer technician. Today he came out as the leaker of classified NSA documents. You don't have to have done anything wrong. You simply have to eventually fall under suspicion from somebody, even by a wrong call. And then they can use the system to go back in time and scrutinize every decision you've ever made. Are you confident that you know everything that's going on within that agency and that you can say to the American people, it's all done the right way? Yes. Uh, I made the statement about that uh, the greatest threat to our uh, constitutional form of government since the Civil War is what's happening now in terms of spying in the United States. And that's the domestic spying program, Stellar Wind, that they started in secret and have been running in secret. Uh, so they're violating the constitutional rights of everyone. Uh, First Amendment rights that are violated because they, uh, you have the right under the First Amendment to have a free, free association. It doesn't say you have the right to free association as long as the government knows about it. That's, that's a direct violation of that one. The Fourth Amendment is clearly violated when they copy, they collect all the content data or they digitally record your phone calls. Um, and, and uh, violate all of your uh, privacy under your affairs. That's a violation of the Fourth Amendment and then using the content of your emails against you in a court of law in secret, again, under the uh, law enforcement use of the NSA data. That's a violation of your Fifth Amendment rights not to testify against yourself. And then when they lie in courts and uh, don't, uh, don't tell you that, uh, give you the right to challenge discovery of the information they really used to arrest you, it's a violation of due process under the Sixth Amendment. So, I mean, they're just scrapping the entire constitutional form of government. This is the greatest threat to our democracy and republic and constitutional form of government since the Civil War. See, uh, unless, we, um, unless we stop the industrial accumulation of information on people, we're heading to a state of society where people will, see the surveillance, just the fact that people are being surveilled uh, uh, inhibits their, their ability or feeling uh, that they have the opportunity to do uh, new and creative and innovative things. So that kind of reduces their risk taking basically, which in turn means you get no less and less creativity and innovation uh, and more and more stagnation of civilization. That's what happened in the Soviet Union, that's what happened in East Germany and the communist bloc. They stagnated because people were being so surveilled that they were afraid of, to do anything. It, it made people afraid to take a risk. And that's really the, the, that's really the point of capitalism. That's why it's been so successful, because it's, it was advocating people taking risks. Americans aren't supposed to sit back and, and let things happen and, and uh, let, uh, let government do what it does. We're supposed to be out there challenging. We have to be participating in our democracy and republic. We cannot sit by and let these things happen and be quiet. If we do, we're going to get this totalitarian state that we're sliding toward right now. Well, that's it for our show tonight.